Welcome back to Questing Beast. I'm Ben. Today we're going to be taking a look at this review copy I was sent of Barrow Maze Complete, which is a classic fantasy mega dungeon by Greg Gillespie. Now, the version that I have here is designed for Labyrinth Lord, which is a version of BX D&D, but it's uh, easily compatible with most OSR systems. And in fact, if you play 5th edition Dungeons and Dragons, then there is a version of this book explicitly restatted for D&D 5e. So if you play that edition, that's all ready to go for you. Um, as always, I will put links to where you can get both of these in the description down below, so you can go check that out. Let's take a look at the back cover here. So this is a mega dungeon in the very classic sense um, with some interesting twists. Uh, for example, a mega dungeon typically has lots of levels going deeper and deeper into the earth with each level um, becoming harder and harder usually corresponding to the character's level. Um, in this case, though, the dungeon is all on one level. The general setup here is that you have a field of barrow mounds, uh, I think a good 70 of them, scattered around this wide open field. And each of these barrows can be investigated. There's little mini dungeons inside, but some of them connect down to Barrow Maze, which is a giant flat dungeon underneath the surface of the earth. It's all on one level, although it does get more dangerous as you go farther east, I believe. So as you explore this dungeon, you may find entrances back up to the upper layer, back up to where the uh, barrows are. So you can find more than one entrance to this dungeon and send uh, expeditions from the nearby town into the dungeon and then back out again, gathering treasure. Let's take a look at what we have inside here. It has a lot of classic black and white uh, fantasy artwork in the OSR style. The layout and the design is very good. I'm usually not a big fan of doing the um, like sans serif Futura font, but I think it actually works really well in this case. I think because the size is a bit bigger than what you normally see. We have a general layout of what the surrounding countryside looks like around the Barrow Maze, along with some nearby deities, if you want to have a little bit of an exploration campaign surrounding the Barrow Maze. Some nearby towns and settlements, and we have the town of Helix, which is the nearby town that's assumed to be your base of operations. We have all the different um, buildings here labeled with a number of NPCs that you're gonna find inside. A lot of great illustrations for what everyone looks like. And that's about it for the introduction because then it gets quickly into what the campaign is like. Ways to set up adventure hooks, uh, random rumors about the Barrow Maze, and a lot of really solid advice for how to run this as a mega dungeon campaign. One thing I really like about this is the way that Greg um, gives you a lot of old school tropes and he explains why they are there and why they are important. So for example, random monsters and uh, rolling on random tables, restocking the dungeon, he explains why those are important and why you need to keep track of them. Uh, especially the way that mega dungeons tend to work as uh, push your luck games. Because the idea is that as you travel into these huge dungeons, your light and your hit points and your other resources will slowly drain as you may run into random encounters. And the question is, can you get back to the surface without being killed? So things like rolling for random encounters when players spend a lot of time digging or searching is a really important rule within these uh, old dungeons to make them work as intended. And he does a really great job uh, reminding you of that and explaining why those things work. He has some interesting twists since this dungeon is mostly focused on the undead. We have um, the way that turning undead is a little bit different. It's a little bit harder um, because it would make clerics very overpowered within a dungeon like this. You also have things like runic tablets that you're going to find scattered throughout the dungeon. And whenever you read them, they could have a very nasty effect or a very beneficial effect, depending on what you roll. So they're like a wand of wonder or a deck of many things in some sense. It's a great way to add spice to the adventure. All right, so moving along, we have a number of different factions. We have a layout in a hex map of what the field of um, barrows looks like. Now, the only question that I have here that I'm not sure was really answered well in the book was how you would do a hex crawl here, since e each hex represents 50 feet. Um, I'm not clear about what the best procedures would be to show players the map and allow them to explore. Should they have to go hex by hex? That seems like that would take too long and it wouldn't be realistic. But also just showing them this map seems like it's too much, since some of these things are intended to be hidden and not obvious right away. 
So I'm not sure what the best solution for that is. I may have to copy this and make some alterations to it before you give it to players. Perhaps there's other possibilities that I'm not thinking of. And we start getting into the barrow mounds. So like I said, there's 70 barrow mounds and each of them is like a small mini dungeon. Uh, many of them are so simple that they don't re really require a map, but the ones that do have them included usually on that page. And the layout for this is usually quite good. Um, there's a couple examples where the actual uh, map for that uh, barrow is on the next page after the description, which is a little aggravating, but by and large, it's set up so that it's very easy to reference. And most of these barrows are very simple and straightforward. In fact, they would work really well as like tutorial dungeons to give players the sense of what it's like to go into dungeon. What are some of the basic tropes you have to look out for? Things like stuck doors and pit traps and all those basic tropes to train them before they start entering the main uh, level of barrow maze. But they can do that right away if they wish. The main entrance is quite obvious, although there are lots of other entrances. And throughout this whole book, what you're going to see is that there's a really nice mix of fairly vanilla standard rooms where there's a couple of skeletons, or maybe there's a, a small trap, or there's just some treasure that you have to search for. And then there's a lot of those, so that there's a little bit of a grind as you go through this dungeon, pushing your luck, getting more and more treasure, um, and seeing if you can get back out again. But, but that's interspersed with occasional, very interesting random encounters and rooms with a lot of flavor and uh, tricks and weird effects that are gonna be exciting for players to encounter. Same thing goes with these barrel mounds. Most of them are fairly standard, um, but every once in a while you'll open up one that's really cool and interesting. So it's a little bit like a lottery as players are going through. So here we go. We begin with the area one, the forbidden antechamber. So the whole dungeon is hundreds of rooms, I think well over 300 rooms. The descriptions go on, here we go, area nine, we're near the end here area 10 and basically it goes up to room 375 or so uh, that is a lot of rooms you could basically run this whole mega dungeon over the course of um years i would expect if you really wanted to get all of the goodies out of it you could run this for years because there's lots of tables for restocking the dungeon as rooms are cleared out players go in they get some stuff they get back out and then when they head back to the dungeon maybe a week later things have moved in to the places that they thought they cleared out. So the dungeon is ever evolving. Let me give you a brief picture of what the map of this thing looks like. It's uh, back here. It's broken up onto all of these pages. So here are just some of the pages showing the size of this thing. All right, so this thing is enormous. The layout for this is quite nice as well because it tells you what page to go to. Like if you go in that direction, you go to page 238, so you know how they all connect together. Um, I suppose you could print them out and um, tape them together to make one really big map, which is something that I might do. But going through these uh, room descriptions, which are all, like I said, very well laid out, and there's a lot of thought put into it in terms of how much description he actually gives you. It's not as terse as some of the things that you might see in like Hot Springs Island, where it's just like bullet points, but it's also, it doesn't err in the other direction of having these really long descriptions of mostly fluff. It's a nice middle ground where for the most part, the rooms are just a paragraph or two, and you can scan them quite quickly and get a sense of what's there. And if there's something really detailed that you need to know, usually the paragraph actually begins by telling you that. So it'll actually say like, there's some interesting traps and tricks going on in this paragraph. Make sure that you read the whole thing before describing it to players. That stuff is really cool. Um, as well, um, the stat lines for each monster are given right after it's noted. So that's really easy to do. You don't have to really do a lot of referencing looking in the back, um, although there is some monsters in the back. Uh, there's a lot of standard monsters as well, which you can find in most fantasy RPGs or refer to Labyrinth Lord if you own that. So this is generally what all of the rooms look like. I'm not going to go through them in detail. Like I said, there's 375 of them, so there's no way I can really do that. But one interesting um, thing here is that burial alcoves is definitely a feature. This whole thing is a giant barrow maze, right? It's a tomb. And there's just lots and lots of burial mounds in here, as well as lots of little holes in the walls where people are buried. So sometimes we'll run into a room and it'll say how many burial alcoves are in this room, like 51. And he has a very simple procedure for figuring out how long it would take to search that number of 
um, of alcoves, depending on how many players you have and how many of them are searching. And that's really important because time management is so important. So each one of these is another little risk reward game that players are going to play. How long am I going to spend searching here and is it going to be worth it? What's another nice thing is, is that every once in a while you have these little bits of box text, but they're not things to read out loud to your players. Instead, they are little anecdotes from what happened in his home game when he was playing this. And that gives you a great sense of the kinds of stories that are possible that just procedurally uh, generate themselves out of the play of Mega Dungeons. There isn't an overall plot, although there is sort of an objective that you can get to. The plot is really something that develops organically as you play the game. And you run into different factions, you have different types of encounters, you gain allies, some of your friends die, and the story just becomes a thing on its own without the book having to make it something. Let's skip ahead a little bit. We have a number of areas. We have the haunted tombs. We have some great little illustrations like this to give players a sense of what they're going to see. The deserted dormitory, the secret shrine of Set, the forgotten crypts. We have the chaos sepulcher of the elements. They have lots of great old school names. The temple of Orcus, the secret vault of the unholy relic, and the lair of Osithrax pejorative which is a great over-the-top name. And the back of the book is full of a good, I don't know, 100 pages or so of supplementary material. Um, one thing that I really would have liked in these room descriptions, I should have brought this up a little earlier, is that uh, a big misstep, in my opinion, is that there aren't little mini-maps on this. When we looked at the pages with the Barrow Mounds, they did have little mini-maps for each of the ones that needed descriptions. But on this... If you look at any particular page of rooms, you have a whole bunch of rooms, but for each one, you're going to have to refer back to the map because you don't have a little picture of where this room is in relation to the ones around it. I think that's a big misstep. I think it would have dramatically improved playability to have something like that. Um, however, if you just printed out all of the maps in the back on your own and have those off to the side, it probably wouldn't be that big of a deal, but it would have been nice to have that included. So in the back here, we have a number of things like uh, new magical items all set up for us new spells we got a variety of new monsters to supplement the classic ones that you're going to find in most monster manuals each of them has a nice simple little stat block as we find in most osr uh, material and a short little description all of the monsters are illustrated we have great stuff like a flagstone golem that's a really fun idea that you're in the part of the dungeon and the flagstones, you know, rise up and rearrange themselves into a dungeon, to a, into a golem to attack you. That's really cool. Or runic golems is made out of these rune tablets that I discussed before. And after you destroy it, then you might have a couple of rune tablets left over that you can use to read and maybe have a good effect, but, or maybe it'll curse you horribly. Moving past the monsters here, we have some pre-generated characters so that you can start off a session just by giving players these if you don't want to spend the time to uh, create your own characters. We have what is awesome and which every uh, Mega Dungeon should have, which is rival adventuring parties. They all have their own names. The Boon Companions, Retentas Robbers, the Norse Whisperers, and so on. Each of which have their own uh, personalities, their own stats, their own feel for that party, and like their general plans and outlook. And of course, you can run into these in the dungeon. They can show up on Wandering Monster Tables. It's a nice um, thing to have in there, given that most of the dungeon is undead focused. So you'll be fighting a lot of zombies and skeletons and whites and shadows and things like that, which are generally very hostile and not really open to negotiation. So running into actual humans um, every once in a while is really great because it adds diplomacy and it adds negotiation back into the game. We have this really cool looking character sheet. Um, I should mention that I'm actually planning on running this. After I read this, I was really... Um, inspired by how easy it looked to use uh, compared to a lot of other mega dungeons that I've seen. And I'm really considering running a Barrow Maze campaign with my uh, fifth grader group at some point in the future. And I would definitely use these character seats because they are very cool looking. You, you just want to color those in, right? Turn into a little coloring book. And we have an illustration book here in the back. This harkens back to um, what I've seen of uh, old modules like Tomb of Horrors 
which had little pictures that you show players periodically. And indeed, as you read different room descriptions, it'll say, oh, you, the players see this. Now show them illustration three. And then you pull this out and you show them illustration three. So players get an actual visual of what's going on that they can use to solve problems by looking at all of the details and as it helps anchor them more firmly in the world. I love stuff like that. Different puzzles and traps have little pictures, for example, so that you don't have to go into a long description of it. You can just show them the picture and then they can try and figure out what's going on here, how this works. We have, as I showed you before, our main map. We have a number of great random tables for uh, random encounters out on the Barrow Moor, which is the area above the Mega Dungeon, um, depending on what level the players are at. Or, of course, you can randomize it so that any level of monster could show up if you want things to be more random and dangerous. We have a patron generator for the local tavern, random dungeon dressing. So these will show up on random tables periodically when you roll for a random encounter. Sometimes instead of a monster, you'll get something like a sinister human cackle or you find a wooden holy symbol on the floor. There's also lots of uh, descriptions throughout all of the rooms of other adventurers, dead ones for the most part that you stumble across, which makes the whole dungeon feel like it's a living place that is constantly being raided by all of these different parties because you find you know, scraps of paper and notes and these little stories um, in the remains left behind by other adventurers, which I think is really cool. Random pit comments, or contents rather, some graffiti, uh, a random barrel mound crypt generator. So you want even more of these little mini dungeons. Here's a procedure for generating them on your own. That's really neat. Ways to determine monsters, grave goods, coins, gems, all your basic tables that you're going to need to run a mega dungeon and a creator worksheet. At the end, we have some notes about the artists, uh, including some luminaries such as Jason, Jason Schultes and Stefan Poeg, um, who's definitely done a lot of work for dungeon crawl classics. And there we go. That is Barrow Maze Complete. Um, it's definitely an incredibly impressive book. I mean, one of the downsides that you're going to hear people talk about is the fact that it is fairly expensive. Uh, I'd say it's more expensive than most books of this size. Uh, however, being a mega dungeon, you have to weigh that against the fact that there is years worth of content here for you to play. All been designed for you, all very easily laid out and um, just ready to go. So you have to balance that, you know, how much it costs versus um, how much playtime you're going to get out of it, which I expect would be a lot. So I'm really happy with this book and I'm actually planning on playing it at some point in the future. Um, so I'm really excited. And if you are too, you can head down to the description and check out where you can get it yourself. Um, this review today was brought to you by my patrons over on Patreon, in particular, two of my newer patrons, Andrew B., and Juan Milano Escar, who have pledged at a high level and are doing an amazing job keeping the channel going. So thank you so much, guys. And stay tuned for next Wednesday when I'm going to be reviewing The Forbidden Caverns of Archaea, which is the next mega dungeon also created by Greg Gillespie. So keep an eye out for that. It's going to be really cool. All right, that's it for this review today. Thanks for watching, everybody. I'll see you guys next time.